Hi, and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be having a panel discussion about how we successfully plan, design, and construct using mass timber for K-12 schools. From pine to panel, I'll be introducing the speakers in just a moment, but before I do, I want to quickly set the stage for the panelists and give a quick overview. So why mass timber? Why are we talking about it right now? And how does it benefit schools? Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have some of the most impressive trees anywhere in the world, which most of you know about. And they do grow tall as these Douglas firs are shown here, towering over a 10-story building in downtown Seattle in the 1920s. I'm not saying that we should be cutting down trees like this, but I am asking the question if we can harness the nature, and the power of nature to actually build smarter. And we've known about the incredible structural properties of wood to build large multi-story buildings for some time now. So what's different today? Why should we be looking back at timber to build schools for the future? Well, I would say in the last 10 years, the landscape of wood construction has changed radically in North America. We have a growing selection of different wood-based engineered building products like cross-laminated timber, dowel-laminated timber, and even time-tested products like glue-laminated timber are being used in new and exciting ways, changing the way that we actually think about wood design and also changing the way that we think about wood on the construction site, how we deliver these elements, how we join them together to make really robust, beautiful structures. And then at the same time, the building codes have been changing as well. Recently, code updates are now uh, created three new construction types that allow actually for K-12 school occupancies up to nine stories in wood. And even before that, the, the existing building code allowed up to four stories of wood for type four construction. So even getting outside of type four construction, type three is really a great choice for schools up to three stories tall or type five construction for up to two story schools. So there's a variety of different options that we can think about to move the building uh, pretty seamlessly through the permitting process using wood. And the other thing that's radically changing now is we've gone from saying climate change to climate crisis, and we know there's a dire need for change. So can using carbon sequestering building materials be part of a solution? Can using materials and natural materials actually help create better learning outcomes that have long-term benefits for our children? These are some of the uh, big issues that we're gonna be discussing today in this panel. So we, we do have a great, uh, collection of panelists here today. Russ Vaughan, who is CEO of Vaughan Timbers in Colville, Washington, has a deep knowledge of how mass timber is produced, manufactured, designed, transported, and built. He, succe he successfully worked with public, private, environmental groups and is a leading voice in forest restoration efforts, forest health, and sustainable resource management. Jason Whitney is a structural engineer who has completed mass multiple mass timber projects and is currently wrapping up design for two K-12 mass timber schools in the area. Jason also leads Coughlin Porter Lundeen's internal mass timber research and development group who supports clients with evidence-based engineering as they integrate the latest technology into their projects. Josh Reed has, 12, has 11 years of construction experience as a carpenter and has worked for Hoffman Construction for seven years as a project engineer on projects such as Kellogg Middle School, Sound Transit light rail stations, and renovations at the University of Washington. Emily Everett is an architect at Malem, having recently worked on Kellogg Middle School, the home of the first acoustic mass timber DLT installation of the US, which we'll be talking about here today. She has a great eye for detail and considers architecture to be a craft, a process that creates both function and beauty in order to benefit the everyday lives of countless students and teachers. And I'm Joe Mayo, an also an architect at Malem and author of the book, Solid Wood, Mass Timber Architecture, Technology and Design. I've completed a number of CLT educational buildings in Washington State, championed building code modifications for mass timber, and I've worked on federal, federally funded grant projects researching the potential of mass timber. So with those introductions, let's move right into the content and get to some questions. So one of the questions that I feel like I hear more than any other is, Will using wood and mass timber mean that we have to cut down all of our forests? I don't think that's true. Um, and I have heard that actually using mass timber could actually have environmental benefits for forest health. And uh, I wanna ask Russ first to get the conversation started. And Russ, would you sh share a few thoughts with us here? 
Yeah, I think, you know, actually what we're doing now is already playing a significant role in, in forest health and forest restoration. Uh, this image here, you can see that <clears throat> in the summertime now, throughout the West, really, um, it's become commonplace to see smoke in our skies, at least, you know, a, a few days, if not a week per year. And it's a really sad situation um, that everybody has to, to go through. And I think when we're talking about uh, you know, climate justice and, and um, social justice, you, know, you start thinking about the, the communities that don't have air conditioning and air filtration and the, and the, the, the uh, imposition that they're being put in and the struggle that, that that causes all people, but especially those that are um, in a situation where they, they can't escape the smoke. Um, so a lot of people talk about it just as climate change, but th that part is true. Um, although the, the other part is our forests in many cases are in really bad shape. And so in, in some cases our forests are uh, burning down at a level that they've never seen before. And it's primarily due to the fact that we have got too many trees out on the landscape. We haven't been thinning the forests appropriately. And, and now there's new science that says that we can actually do great work on the forest to restore them and make them beautiful um, and healthy. And so we can use uh, the best in ecological science and forest management to come up with prescriptions on the landscape, leaving the biggest and best trees behind so we don't end up with a forest like this that, that turns into a moonscape that takes decades and decades to recover, but we end up with a healthy forest. And the, the healthy forest is really the core product of what we're trying to create. The byproduct of that is what goes to the, the mills and goes to the CLT plants to create these products that can create the schools. And you can see here that the, the trees that are coming out of the forests are relatively small. And the new technology that we have now, we can actually improve the health of the forest, take those small logs, turn those relatively small pieces of wood into large elements that uh, architects and engineers can design and, and, and put into projects and contractors can then build in new ways to create beautiful energy efficient buildings that are using the best in, um, in science and uh, product to create these beautiful schools. So in this image here, you can see that we take these small logs and they go to the sawmill. And in this case, this is Colville, Washington. My family's mill, Vaughan Brothers Lumber is right next to our CLT plant. And then they cut that into two by sixes and two by eights and two by fours. And then we take that product and put it through a press. And that press creates cross laminated timber, glue lamb beams and glue laminated timber panels. So we're actually taking the carbon that's in those trees and we're encapsulating it and embedding it in the, the product for the life of that building. For, you know, if the, the building lasts 75 to 200 years, the carbon that was in that tree is gonna be in that building for the, the life of it. And that's a, that's a great story in and of itself. But the other thing about mass timber, you know, we're on the front end of it, but I've learned from, from people around Europe that um, these buildings are actually recyclable. I mean, we can take them apart and reuse a lot of these parts and pieces for new buildings in the future. So when, and, and we've seen that already, you know, the, the prior um, uh, buildings in, in Seattle uh, 100 years ago were made of wood. And so you see a lot of times where we're changing the, the type and use of the land from industrial to maybe residential and we go through some of these old buildings and we reclaim these old timbers and that people find a lot of value in those and I can see a century from now as we start changing the landscape and to start uh, needing something different that we take these buildings apart and reuse them and that's the beauty of wood it's a it's a really amazing material but if we also manage the forests in the appropriate way we can have the best of all worlds we can save the environment, save the planet, and embed the carbon in the product itself and have these wonderful buildings. Yes, yeah, so that's really inspirational. And I, it seems like we do need to start thinking differently about the forest and the materials that we're using and how that can play into creating these wonderful environments for children. 
Um, but what is it? So we know Mass Timber is a relatively new product here in North America. Um, from a design and uh, how we design buildings, how might it be different? from conventional materials like steel and concrete. And, and Jason, as a structural engineer, I know that you're really at the forefront of this. Can you talk to that point for just a minute about kind of key considerations for mass timber design? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing that you need to consider is you need to design and lay out your building um, for mass timber. So you, right from the get-go, you need to be thinking about that. So there are some key considerations to think about when laying out a mass timber building for a school project. Um, one of the first things to think about is your construction type. We would recommend for going with a non-rated construction type for your project, say a 3B, a 5B, or even like you mentioned earlier, Joe, uh, one of the type four HT, the legacy heavy timber type of building construction type allows for um, really simplicity of your structure. While you can build projects with a construct different construction types that have a fire rating. Um, oftentimes to achieve that fire rating, that one or two hour rating, there is some oversized material or connections need to be thought about in a specific way on how you deal with that and maintain fire ratings and even penetrations through those assemblies, especially if you're going to expose them. So start with construction type. The second thing we would recommend is really looking at minimizing your roof and floor panel thickness. The panels on these mass timber projects have a lot of fiber and material. So the, the most, the, what you can do to minimize that thickness of material would be, is usually um, a way to economize your structure. So something in the range of a three or a five ply or a two by four, or two by six DLT type of product, anything thicker um, than that typically will yield inefficient results. Column spacing. Um, and we'll touch on this in a minute. I'll, I'll circle back to the column spacings, but, but generally your column spacings need to be a little bit tighter than what you may see for a steel or a concrete building. So sticking into the range of 22 to 26 ish type of feet will keep your beam sizes um, and column sizes to reasonable, um, reasonable depths. It, you can go longer, but again, your, your structure is going to see increases in sizes and you can lose some economy. Uh, we'd also recommend lightweight floor toppings. Um, we, while you can do a structure and use a structural concrete topping with reinforcing, we would just recommend taking advantage of that, you know, CLT material of the floor panel. It has a lot of strength and stiffness in it. So finding opportunities to use that system itself as a seismic diaphragm, and then just use a non-structural concrete, uh, like a gypcrete topping um, on top of that would be uh, our recommendation. And kind of goes without saying, but keeping everything really repetitive and really regular is, is very important for mass timber, especially when you start to think about erection and constructability. And then um, finally, the, the proper vertical and lateral system selection. So by that, you know, we, we kind of mean we'd recommend sticking with code prescribed systems. Uh, a bolted steel frame syncs up really well with the mass timber structure because you can put up those pieces in tandem with the mass timber structure. However, a CMU shear wall or concrete shear wall um, designs are very compatible with mass timber buildings as well, um, or potentially even a, a light frame stick, uh, a stick light frame shear wall. Um, you may need more of them, but there are solutions in that with a, a, a low rise K through 12 type of project. While you may hear that, you know, there are CLT panels or mass plywood panels that can be used as shear walls. We wouldn't recommend it at this time just because um, to do that, you have to go through a code alternate approach. And, and generally the restrictions that jurisdictions we find place on those systems will just yield inefficient results at this time. But do look for that to change in the future as building codes continue to develop and more testing and research is brought to market. And then another thing to think about for school projects specifically is that you need to design for competitive bidding. Um, CLT, CLT, DLT, those types of products, they're somewhat proprietary in nature. So not all manufacturers make exactly the same products, but there is a bit of overlap with material. Um, so we'd recommend finding those overlap products that a lot of manufacturers make and then designing your structure, laying out your structure to best suit those products. So typically what this means is for CLT panels, utilizing um, the, the one and three eighths inch lamination stock that most manufacturers carry. 
So this would be a four and eighth inch thickness for a three ply panel or a six and seven eighths inch thickness for a five ply. Um, and then regarding the, the material itself of the lamps, you're gonna wanna stick with a visually, visually graded product instead of a machine graded. Uh, some manufacturers do make machine graded products and they're stronger and stiffer products at the end of the day, but again, let's make it. So, so find that ways to expand your bidding pool. And then circling back on the point about columns, this is just an example showing maybe more of a conventional steel pr project on the right side where column spacings were about 31 feet um, and a mass timber school project on the left where the column spacing, you know, along the length of the girder was 25 feet. So an example of two different types of classroom layouts, the left one is much better suited to, to, to work well with mass timber yielding about the same square footage of classroom space. Wow. Jason, so it sounds like mass timber can be really an effective, used just as effectively as some of the more traditional material types we have out there. Um, just thinking about it also from an architectural perspective, it seems like there's a great potential for these buildings to feel less institutional um, and have um, different aesthetic qualities to them. Um, so how, how do these mass timber schools actually feel different? How can they feel different? Emily, I'm wondering if you could share some of your insights on that. Sure. So although the beauty of wood uh, could be a strong and potentially only reason uh, to utilize and build with wood, um, the Malum practice is actually rooted in the idea that humans have an instinct to connect with nature and other living things. In fact, this is the definition of uh, biophilia. So Biophilic, biophilic design uh, by encouraging nature in the space, uh, natural analogs or nature of the space uh, has been studied to actually support cognitive function, physical health and psychological well-being of occupants. Uh, Terrapin Bright Green released these 14 patterns of biophilic design. And as we switch to the next slide, uh, we've actually highlighted the patterns that are employed by simply using wood as a finish in the space. These patterns um, include connection to nature, which could be highlight highlighted through simple placement of windows or creating a natural rhythm evoking a forest as employed in the image of a shared learning space on the bottom right here at Wilkes Elementary School. And also reports show that visual, tactile and auditory stimulation of wood materials induce physiological relaxation. So if you pair this with the simple fact that wood is an inherently antibacterial product, I ask, is it not the perfect material for use in schools? So as you look at um, some images of our recently comp uh, completed project, Lake Ridge Middle School here, I also ask when looking at the screen, did you just take a deep breath and did you feel a sense of calm as you were kind of enveloped in all of this wood space um, between the DLT, the glue lamp panels and uh, all of these wood columns? Yeah, Emily, these, these spaces do feel radically different and, and you can imagine walking into this and feeling somewhat like you're entering a forest, it's amazing. Um, so to, to get to our next question, I'm thinking we've, in, in the news recently, we've seen a lot of uh, information about lumber prices fluctuating and because schools often need to get a kind of a, a set price, I'm wondering how does the, the commodity price of lumber start to, does it have any effect on how we might cost effectively d deliver mass timber schools? And, and Russ, I think you might be intimately familiar with uh, price of lumber and, and how we can track that and uh, utilize that best for uh, delivering schools. Yeah, uh, you know, mass timber is made primarily of lumber. Uh, and so the, the cost input of lumber drastically affects the uh, input cost of a mass timber structure. So as you can see here, this is just showing the different changes in prices over years. And we've been, since the, the start of the, the COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of disruptions on supply chain and logistics and all kinds of things that are leading to really high and erratic um, uh, commodity pricing and lumber is a commodity. So we've seen all time highs in, in lumber price in uh, 2021. And what, what we suggest is that you work with your team and find a manufacturer that you're confident that if, if locking in a price is really important, which in the case of schools, it really is, finding um, a manufacturer that's willing to support those prices um, 
for the, the construction time cycle is really going to be important so that there isn't some sort of uh, unknown change order request and lumber pricing because the manufacturer doesn't have the, the lumber price that they um, supported that price with in their inventory. And so I think that's important to, to think about when you're doing these projects. And then um, it's also something to where there's some information out there that we see and, you know, when lumber prices go way up, we see it in the news. So it's easy to find the price, but you'll see that there's a wide fluctuation from, you know, $300 a thousand board feet all the way up to, you know, a few weeks ago, it was over $1,500 a thousand board feet. Now it's going down quite drastically. So um, th there's a lot of people that have been, following this and saying, wow, lumber prices are high. Are we ever gonna be able to build with, uh, with mass timber or wood again? Well, it's, it's already coming back down drastically and it's just the nature of disruptions. And so being a commodity price, uh, a commodity product that prices up and down, I think it's just important to understand that. And so um, if locking in a price for a budget is important, there are manufacturers that are out there. I would encourage you to, to share that with partners as they're going to bid, say, hey, having a locked in price is absolutely critical versus maybe looking at this and saying, hey, the, the lumber price looks really high right now. By the time we are building uh, 18 months from now, um, maybe we can work with our contractor and our supplier to lock in a pricing sometime between now and then that's going to be more effective for our project. So I think it's just important to know that these things fluctuate and that there are people out there that have navigated these things for a long time and, and, and going out and understanding that and asking for their input. I, I found that not only myself and others in the industry are more than willing to share perspectives on the way things are uh, being affected at any given time. Yeah, Ross, that's great advice. And I know that we're focusing mostly on lumber and mass timber here, but prices of basically almost all materials are going up. So lumber is definitely not unique in that, in that aspect. Um, so circling back, talking a little bit more about cost, and we know that um, for schools uh, being cost competitive and um, kind of being driven by tight budgets are pretty, pretty normal. So I want to circle back on how, how we can do that with mass timber. What's the way that we can be the most efficient and therefore um, not run into issues when we get into bidding and be able to provide these schools without any hiccups. And Jason, I know you have a lot of experience on that. So I wonder if you can provide some additional insights. Jason, you might unmute. Be unmute. There we go. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So it's like you said, um, with our school projects, generally, we don't have an ability to, to know who, who exactly we're going to have right up front. So we have to, there's a couple key metrics we can keep in mind when we're laying out and designing mass timber structures. One of them would be just kind of what we call fiber efficiency. And it's, it's talking about really just calculating the total volume of wood. So the, the total fiber on your project of your, your columns, your beams, your panels, and dividing that over your area of your building. And that ratio that you get back kind of tells you a lot about the efficiency of your structure. So if you're within values of 0.6 to 0.8, those are numbers that are typically telling you that you've, you've really used your, your you know, structure very efficiently. If you're getting values that are over one, um, you're, you're probably gonna find that you're, you're gonna have a, a premium in your structure is going to be a bit a bit inefficient and expensive. Uh, another key thing to think about on the next slide, Joe, would be about just the overall total number of pieces. So this this thinks a little bit more about the erection side of the equation than just the material. And this was an example of a study that we did on a project where on the right side we had a a, a structure layout that utilized 11 foot girders. So this was a, a one way post and beam system and then uh, CLT panels that, that span to those, those girders. So we utilized three ply panels at the floor and the roof on the, on the right side, the 11 foot spacing. And on the left side, we looked at a option where we used, where we spaced those out from 11 feet to 15 feet, utilized a five ply panel for the floor and still kept the three ply panel at the roof. Um, the, the material analysis that was done told the team um, that basically it was about a, a cost neutral in terms of the overall amount of material. 
And so that really kind of told the story of, okay, well, there's significantly less number of pieces to have to pick and place. So their erection costs are going to come down. So that was going to be the more efficient solution. So the team moved forward with the 15 foot beam spacing. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's really great advice. And I know each, each element that you place has, has time implications. So uh, speeding up the construction time and also if there's weather moving in, being able to get the building weather tight as quick as possible and everything we can do. And these, these are really smart design uh, choices. And uh, we've all heard that the devil is in the details. Is that also true for mass timber? Uh, and when we're considering uh, using mass timber, are there uh, specific detail level, level questions that we should be considering for this material versus say steel or concrete? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, with mass timber, it's, there's a lot of proprietary components that, that are on the market that you can be used and they're, and they're made specifically for mass timber building. So you want to become intimately familiar with those products and find, you know, what, what works well and what, what doesn't work well. So here's a, an image on the right of some concealed beam connectors. They get installed at the ends of the Goulam beams and they typically frame into either another beam or they frame into the side of say a, a bypassing column. Uh, they can be concealed. So you don't see them at the end of the day, which makes them very nice, but they do have very little uh, tolerance built within them. So if you are designing all of your connections on a project with these really low tolerance connectors, um, that's, that could be pose a challenge for the construction side and, and the erection, something to keep in mind. So uh, another thing would just be fasteners themselves. There are a lot of proprietary mass timber screws on the market. They're typically long screws. They're self-tapping. Um, they can either come in fully threaded or partially threaded. So they have their applications of when to use them. For example, a partially threaded screw would be a, a great application to use where you're fastening a, a CLT panel down to a glue lamp beam. You want the, the thread to be into the beam and not within the CLT so you can suck those materials and ensure that they have a tight fit. A fully threaded would, would kind of lock it into place into however it was installed. Um, now, while these products, they are great products, they, they are efficient to install and use for mass timber, they can be a bit expensive. So, you know, we, we found it to be most successful where we use the proprietary or the long uh, timber type of screws in the right applications, but really find opportunities to use more conventional type of screws that we see, say, from that Simpson makes with SDS or SDWS type of screws for any applications that you can um, find, find to use them. So definitely know where to spend the money on these proprietary products. Um, and it will help the overall budget for, for the project. The next point to make would just be, you know, thinking about how are you going to, to build the building in a sequence. So the image on the right would be something that we've seen from conventional steel projects. You pour your footing, um, you would pour your slab on grade, then they would have the diamond block outs, allowing your steel column to then get fastened to the top of the footing. And then you would come back through and pour your, um, pour in that, that, that block out. Um, but with mass timber, you can't, you don't want to install wood into the concrete. That's, that's, uh, that would lead to a lot of problems down the road. So a detail on the left shows uh, a, a detail that we've come up with about how, to, how you would do this for a mass timber project. So this would be a, a monolithic slab on grade pour with a thickened slab footing. And then you would come through and, and fasten down your base plate for your wood column directly to that component. So sequences changes, but you're detailing specifically for the wood material that you're using for your project. Wow. And that actually seems like it might be even a simpler installation without having to go back and re-pour concrete. Yep. It's less, less, less number of pours and, um, and, and it, it, you know, a detail like this makes a lot more sense than an embed of trying, you don't have formwork necessarily that you're using. So Again, really, really working if you have a contractor available, talking to them, working through some of these details and, and finding ways to, to build in the tolerances. And Josh, I think you had a point here about the, uh, the trades. Yeah, for sure. And when it comes to construction, the devil's definitely is in the details. Uh, when we 
brought out the scopes of work for both the wood and steel components that we had on our project. There was definitely some assumptions made, which led to us uh, starting early on coordination meetings between the design team, the steel fabricator director, the wood fabricator director, and ourselves to really go through the details and make sure that um, you know, all the uh, details fit together uh, appropriately and that the sequence works for both parties. And so the image you see on the screen here, the initial design had uh, welded studs sticking up from the top of the wide flange um, that the uh, wood ledger would uh, fasten down to. And what we ran into is with the iron workers setting that steel created a trip hazard uh, for them as they were walking the steel and setting it. And so we, uh, they said that they could drill holes in the flange and that wouldn't be an issue. So we worked with the design team to find a way to use fasteners to come from below to attach the ledger so that we could set those DLT panels on there. And those are certain things that just have to be taken into consideration. And then when it comes to the uh, erection side of the materials, we have two different contractors, you know, the steel contractor setting the steel columns and some of the uh, horizontal members. And then we have the wood mass timber erector setting the beams and the DLT. And typically with the steel structure, you set all your components and their finger tight connections. And then a bolting crew comes back through and tightens everything up, gets it plumb level square. And then they walk away, the next contractor comes in. Unfortunately with the wood, there needed to be a certain level of play and adjustment in the steel in order to get the members to fit. In addition to the sequence of when the members would go in, which also created some challenges with uh, when the steel members would go in and how they were bolted, what direction the bolts went in had to be taken into consideration. So early on coordination was critical to making sure all of these components fit properly and in the right order. Wow. Yeah, that does sound like the devil is in the details and um, working through early pre-installation meetings is, is probably really critical to a successful project. Um, so in diving into the details, another detail-oriented question that always comes up is because these mass timber panels are really solid wood, where, where we don't have a chase space or any openings really to run electrical or other services. So how do we start integrating those in um, without having a, a cluttered appearance of conduits and, and services chasing around everywhere? And Emily, I know you have some experience with this. Could you share your thoughts? Yeah, I can highlight a few ways we've routed electrical conduits first. So here at Lake Ridge Middle School, we actually um, utilized the mass timber dowel laminated timber panels um, and just spaced them apart uh, to leave the conduit exposed. So in this condition, we are leaving uh, the electrical conduit exposed below the deck sheathing, but just between the DLT panels. And you can just um, see it's a little bit more industrial in the way that these um, are routed above the beams uh, but below the deck sheathing but then at Kellogg Middle School uh, also another DLT project uh, we increased the spacing uh, between the DLT panels um, and we increased it actually to 11 inches to include even more conduits uh, to be able to be run so in fact the DLT panels here were sized so that the electrical conduits could be located um, for speakers and for lighting fixtures. Um, and then the electrical conduits, the J boxes were set and run. And uh, we actually detailed in a plywood cover panel that is removable. Um, it looks, it's routed and uh, routed to look like the DLT panel itself. Uh, but then that uh, covers all of this routing so that it is not visible. Wow, that's pretty ingenious. That's really cool. Um, and I've worked on a project um, moving to cross laminated timber instead of dowel laminated timber where we ran into some um, similar issues. Here is a early learning center at the state capitol and I'll show some finished images in a moment. But what we're looking at here, the image on the right is the top of a CLT panel where we've had a self-adhered uh, vapor retarder pre-applied at the CLT factory. That's that gray membrane. And that really saved a lot of time during, on the construction site because it was already pre-applied and reduced any risk of water damage and wet weather construction. Um, 
And then you can see here, it's a little bit hard to tell, but we have, we've routed out an inch and a half by an inch and a half inch uh, channels on the top side of this CLT roof deck. Um, and that allowed us to lay conduit um, flush with the top of the CLT panel. So that way, when uh, we came back with our um, board insulation on top of the roof, everything was flush and neat. And it also allowed us a place to conceal that conduit so that um, Looking at the image on the left is showing during construction, uh, all you really see is the J box or the electrical box coming down uh, flush with the surface of the CLT wood deck below. And then the image on the right, a more finished photo showing that um, really all we have on the ceiling uh, through careful coordination are the light fixtures, fan, and some photo sensors for daylight uh, zones in the room. So really, you're able to use mass timber and keep a very clean appearance and uh, highlight the beauty of wood. The last image was talking about a roof, but we can also do something similar for a floor assembly as well. Here we're talking about a, an acoustic floor assembly where we're also again running conduit on top of the CLT here a floor panel and we're leaving the CLT on the underside exposed and able to be clean, orderly and very attractive. Um, and often you might see conduit on the top side of a CLT floor deck cast in a topping slab or a raised floor system or in this case we're ut utilizing a floating floor system. And so those are some examples for a CLT and how you might uh, conceal services in a floor or roof. Other, there's certainly a lot of different options. Um, I've also seen using um, acoustic baffles to help conceal services. Uh, the image on the left here is showing surface mounted raceways as a way to um, deliver, deliver services within uh, a classroom environment or you can actually recess J boxes and electrical boxes into solid wood elements as well here, a uh, cross laminated timber panel. And I would say just make sure you check with your structural engineer before poking probably too many holes into your solid wood elements, but it's certainly something that is possible. In addition to electrical services too, this photo uh, shows Kellogg Middle School's Commons dining space, uh, where we actually carefully routed the fire piping uh, to align with the structural bays um, and service uh, one directionally um, across each of the bays. This image, we sh will show a more finished image here um, soon, but uh, the primed fire pipe here makes it a little bit more visible. So hopefully you don't see it uh, in the next image as much. Yeah, that's great. That's so how we've been talking with about construction, but before we get to construction, we have to um, submit permit drawings to the jurisdiction. So um, just quickly, I'm wondering if has anyone run into any issues with jurisdictional approvals when it comes to mass timber schools or ma other mass timber buildings? Generally, no. Um, you know, you, you definitely want to go about it in the right way. So if you are looking to do something that is outside of the confines of the building code which mass timber and clt those those components are within the building code themselves but how you use them sometimes may not be so earlier i touched on using them as, as shear walls and you know um, for lateral force resistance systems that's not covered in the building code um, nor are using the CLT, clt only as a seismic diaphragm so if you have a project and you do want to utilize some of these approaches they've been done successfully numerous times we've, we've done them on many local jurisdictions around the area gotten approval so you know the approach you want to take here is just to get in early with the city have a, a pre-application meeting get the building um, building official in the room and, and just talk to them and, and really just think about it as involving them as a design partner for the project um, and explaining what you're doing um, educating as needed and, and generally we found that approach to be uh, quite successful and really when you go to submit for permit and go through that process on the back end of a project, uh, there's usually little to no, um, no issues with jurisdictions to date. Yeah, Jason, that's great. I know we even worked together to do a use CLT as a structural shear wall for a classroom building and we're able to get that through the jurisdiction without and really any problem. So even when looking outside the code, there's still opportunities to, to do so. So those are, that's some great advice. Um, 
And as we dive more into uh, one of the benefits that is often br brought up with mass timber is the speed. So what are the schedule implications of using mass timber? And is there a time advantage for mass timber? And when does that really start to play out? And Josh, I wonder if you could um, take a moment to share some some of your thoughts with us. Uh, first of all, the, the collaboration is imperative. Before you start construction, you need to make sure that you engage the third party inspectors. In this case, on the project we were working on, it was maze testing engineers. And just having them come out, review the details with you, and just ensure that they have the right people allocated to the necessary inspections. Um, and then also early on, you want to engage both the wood and steel fabricator erectors like I talked about earlier. So looking at the schedule, you can see that um, zone A was a steel truss structure with decking on top and it was uh, exposed to view. Uh, you can see that that started in July and got finished up in the first part of August, relatively short duration for erecting the structure. But you also see later on zone A paint and ceiling grid um, in the gymnasium where zone A is, uh, that whole roof had to be painted. So if you tack on the, the paint duration and the erection duration, it's, it's pretty substantial. If you go down to the Z, zone B and C erect glue lamb the DLT, um, it's a little bit longer for the erection, but because no additional finishes had to be applied, once that was set, it was done. We didn't have to have any painters or ceiling guys come in to finish the work. And so in the end, it uh, shortened that duration and reduced the number of subcontractors that had to be involved with the work. And then looking at this uh, video here, you can see that the crane in the foreground was primarily the, the wood erectors and the crane in the background was the steel erectors. And as the video progresses, you can see the steel erectors moving just ahead of the, the wood erectors. And when necessary, the iron workers would fall back, make adjustments to columns or the uh, uh, horizontal beams that connected some of those steel members together, adjusting them just so we could get the materials to fit. And it actually worked fairly smooth uh, working from the left side of the image all the way to the right. And then this photo here, it's a beautiful shot from down below as the DLT panels are being set on the glue lamps. You see it, they have those uh, voids in there that we're using as mechanical or electrical chases. On the top side, this is the uh, image of the zip system that was pre-installed on the panels before it came out. Uh, this was a temporary weather barrier system and a sheathing system all in one. Uh, and it really allowed us to speed up the process of uh, getting the material in and providing a modest level of protection from the weather. But I would say it's important to coordinate with the roofing uh, installer to have them come in as quickly as possible behind the complete installation of the roof and these infill panels to ensure that we don't get water seeping through any joints in the DLT system um, and potentially causing damage in this case to the insulation baffles in between those joints or staining the DLT panels themselves because they are raw. They don't have a finish applied to them. And this is a good shot of the finished panel going in between the two DLT panels um, and having to be nailed off. And this kind of circles back to that discussion with the third party inspectors and making sure they know what the nailing patterns are and how these systems are supposed to coordinate with each other. And then the other thing you'll notice too is this uh, tape that goes down on the joints. This is an integral part of the weather protection um, that the zip system provides. And this system is pretty good for you know minor rain events and whatnot, but I would not suggest it for long-term weather protection. Well, oh, great, Josh. That's really great information. And I think right now we want to, we've been talking about uh, Kellogg Middle School and the installation of DLT. So right now we're going to dive a little bit deeper and do a mini case study. And Emily, I wonder if you could talk us through the project a little bit in more detail. Yeah, of course. Um, 
Kellogg is actually a 152,000 square foot middle school in Shoreline, Washington. Um, the overall building is a two-story E occupancy and type 2B construction uh, where we only have mass timber at the roof. So if you um, see on the left image here, uh, the north-south green bar uh, of scope, that is uh, the DLT at the library at Kellogg. And then the right image shows DLT expanse from entry to commons in this east-west orientation uh, green area here as well. So uh, in design, the intent was always to create a wood cap on this space, um, really just feeling like you were uh, encapsulated by this uh, wood uh, above. And um, the, the wood cap would sit above this ribbon of punched window openings. So this is our initial rendering uh, with the design intent. As we go to the next image of a more finished uh, view of it, you'll actually see with the window shades up, um, we also are able to get views to the treetops uh, beyond. And since we've already talked about the electrical chases and the fire piping, you can now see how they hopefully have um, kind of gone to the back uh, of this image and are less visible now. One more image I'd like to share um, is actually of the DLT much closer um, at the library where it is actually just a one story space. So you're uh, a little bit closer to it here. As Josh was saying, um, the DLT panels, the dowel laminated timber panels are raw um, on both, in both instances at Kellogg Middle School here. Um, so you can see the differences between the dug fir glue lamb beams and then the spruce pine fir. Uh, DLT panels um, and as they age they the color coloring of them does get to be um, more monotone. Great thanks Emily and I know um, we've been showing it here and a primary consideration for even using mass timber at all uh, really early in design is that uh, you want to leave those you want to leave as much mass timber exposed as possible um, what are the other architectural considerations for exposing mass timber? So going back to this uh, library slide, for example, um, in a library, uh, you actually have high acoustic properties that are going to be needed in that space. And if we also think back to the, the commons, um, acoustics is really an integral part of what makes um, you able to expose the wood in the space. So especially at Kellogg Middle School. If we go to the next uh, slide, you can see all of the dowel laminated timber profiles that were available to us um, when we were in design. Uh, these are the profiles by StructureCraft. Um, and many of these you could potentially seal. Um, so I know that we have said that at Kellogg, uh, the acoustic square was the one that was used. Um, because of all of the ins and outs of the profile, we did not, uh, we did not seal or you can't really uh, eff effectively seal the product. So it is left raw. But these are all of the different options um, that are available. The two acoustic profiles though um, were of interest to us uh, for the Kellogg Middle School projects um, in order to utilize these two bilaminations. You can see here in this image a close up of the two bilaminations with the paper faced bat in between, and then the little diagram of how it is doweled together. Um, this actual acoustic profile was able to be rated at an NRC of 0.7, which is pretty similar to a standard acoustic ceiling tile. Um, so in the library space, uh, completely adequate for what our needs were. And as you can see here, this is a the beautiful photo of really just being capped in wood and um, the library was located where it was so that it could be, uh, you can see through the ribbon windows um, right out in the treetops. So I said acoustics was the one of the imp most important parts of um, getting DLT on this project. And I will say though that we actually started um, with the assumption that we were going to be utilizing CLT and glue lamb beams. Uh, and so actually with the work of Hoffman, we were able to um, look at a couple of different options. Of course, we want to expose this wood. That was the main intent, um, you know, keeping it a sense of place in the woods. Uh, but if you utilize CLT, sorry, CLT and glue lamb beams, um, then we would actually have to include also an acoustic cloud ceiling to accommodate the acoustics of the space. So if you can imagine a really loud commons dining eating area um, without any acoustics in that space, it would be really reverberant and 
potentially really loud. Um, but you can see the price there for the CLT and glue lamb beams um, was on the higher end. We also had Hoffman look into what it would look like to go to a metal deck on steel joists, but then have an acoustic wood ceiling. So still um, wanting that wood finish. And of course the finish itself, when you're adding all parts um, individually, uh, ended up actually costing more. So that is how we ended up with Acoustic DLT, the newest <laughs> product at the time that was available that could have um, an NRC rating uh, and still get that finish um, of wood. So keeping one product um, or one as a structure and acoustics and f finish, uh, that is how we were able to uh, see the value of DLT and continue along with DLT on the Kellogg Middle School project. Oh, that's great. I know there's going to be other products coming on the market that have acoustic uh, properties as well. Uh, but just circling back to, we we talked a lot about acoustics and DLT, but what about acoustics and CLT or other mass wood systems? Um, this is an example of a learning environment that we just recently finished where, um, again, we wanted to expose as much of the wood as possible. So we didn't want acoustic surfaces on the wood ceiling. Instead, we were able to actually add enough acoustic wall paneling around the room to in, in areas of uh, throw rugs to provide a, as much uh, acoustic um, mitigation as was needed for those rooms. So still able to expose the wood and then get that acoustic finish in a different way. And here we're holding the acoustic wall panels fairly high off the wall to keep them as much out of the kind of touch zone as possible. And then this is a, uh, I mentioned really early on that we've been part of a few U.S. Forest Service uh, wood innovation grants. This is a grant study looking at how we can more successfully use mass timber for K-12 schools. And here, um, and we'll be sharing more on this project soon, but this is looking at how we can uh, provide great acoustics but still expose wood with a CLT floor deck. So here we found that we can actually expose around two thirds of the CLT ceiling and only require about one third of the ceiling to be to use a, a acoustic drop ceiling. Um, and that provides actually some double benefit. So where we have this uh, ac a acoustic drop ceiling, we're also able to concealed ducting and other services. So still getting that really clean look, but being able to expose as much of the wood as possible. And um, we've been talking about construction and uh, I know there's a lot of uh, things that are changing in the world of construction with technology. And in mass timber actually uh, really integrates well with digital fabrication as I understand. So Russ, I'm wondering if you could step in and share some more about digital fabrication in mass timber. Yeah, you know, we hear a lot about digital fabrication, but you know, what does that really mean? Um, we use state-of-the-art CNC machines. Well, CNC means computer numeric controls, which basically mean it's a numeric grid that we can use to position tooling to make things with a very precision cut. Um, in many cases, uh, we have to talk to people about the tolerances that they're used to in the cuts because they're so precise on the machinery that they sometimes need a little bit more play than they're used to um, from their other materials. So in this uh, setting, we, we did a, a curved um, circular staircase with glue lamb and we did all of the precision cutting that had to be made for this to, to, to work. And it's not just the, the curvature and the flat surface, it's also the connection points within the, the stair tread themselves and then doing all the fine cutting for the, the traction bars at the end. Um, this is just gives you an idea of the, the finite capability of digital fabrication, but it also um, allows us to use the latest in, um, in BIM modeling and 3D modeling in structures. So we can do some value engineering. We've talked a lot today about different materials and products and being able to have competitive bids. Um, I think that's, it's, it's really important that um, we're taking advantage of that three dimensional space in the beginning as we start talking about 
not only design and how it looks, but how do we optimize for mass timber? How do we get the right thickness and pieces and spans and all those parts together? And then we can tie that back to the three-dimensional digital fabrication in the actual wood itself. And then we can even do things to make construction times easier and faster. And that in this case, we're actually doing the cutting uh, with the CNC to pre-fit all of the connection systems on. So once they, they get out of our shop, we then place them on the truck in order so that when the truck arrives, the first piece that Josh and his crew would pick up would be the, the piece that needs to be put in place next. So that, that we're kind of trying to be an extension of, our, uh, of the construction site in our shop. So that that way it goes from the truck right to the job site and it's ready to go. And that's how we achieve really good scheduling is when we're all working together. But that, that new technology that we're utilizing in kind of an old world, which there's been mass timber um, and timber erection for a long time. Heavy timber has been around for a long time, but utilizing the new technology and CNC and digital fabrication, merging those together and then communicating that from design all the way to construction to the end use. I think is really going to be where we see um, big gains in the future and allows us to be um, build the best possible structures that are state of the art, that are high performing, but also beautiful and eco friendly. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And this is another uh, example of some uh, digital fabrication uh, potential where we have uh, it's around a 30, 35 foot wall panel with the windows pre-cut and this wall just gets placed as is and there is really um, nothing else on the interior that needs to happen. And so we can place these panels super quick and then the weather barrier goes on the outside and the windows get placed. And um, it's really just ways of thinking about design and integrating information into the BIM model and into this digital fabrication can really be a time saver. Um, and you might be front loading some of that design time, but it really uh, pays uh, big dividends during the construction process. Um, so with more and more digital fabrication, are there more exciting new mass timber opportunities that we might not be aware of? And I know we're running a little short on time with about uh, three or four minutes left. So we'll really quickly here at the end cover another project, Lake Ridge Middle School, and talk about um, utilizing whole trees for structure. Um, so Emily, I wonder if you could hop in here and talk about Lake Ridge a little bit. Definitely. So the Lake Ridge Middle School community uh, put a priority on utilizing sustainable materials from the start. Um, and actually on site, they had these beautiful groves of trees that really couldn't be avoided um, in placing the new middle school. So um, they actually enlisted Whole Trees, who uh, is really an expert in mapping, 3D mapping, uh, cloud mapping forests, uh, to actually be able to cut uh, trees down specifically for column locations within any given building. And they actually came out to site and uh, mapped trees on site uh, for repurposing them. And so uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, there were a handful of trees. Actually, they were able to, the whole uh, design team, you know, with enlisting the arborist, uh, structural engineer, whole trees, of course, um, demo contractor, and GC, for instance, uh, all got together and they were able to highlight 29 trees on the site that were able to be uh, felled but for repurposing um, within the building and these were Oregon white oaks uh, which would be chosen for exterior purposes scarlet oaks and sweet gum trees if you go to the next slide joe uh, these were actually uh, sent off uh, to a partner in Washington. Um, so everything was done within 20 miles, or sorry, 200 miles of the site. Um, sent over for processing, well, visual grading, processing, and fabrication. So each of these trees was debarked by hand, sanded, uh, given a borate treatment uh, for mold and mildew. And then um, the interior columns were also then kiln dried before they were returned um, to the site. Uh, this is an image of all of the um, of some of the columns from above that were cloud mapped. So KPFF um, 
Seattle as the structural engineer actually utilized these point clouds to determine the capacity, the structural capacity of each of these columns. Um, and then if you can continue on Joe, uh, the detailing was also um, very specific per location. Uh, as you can see, each column then has a different uh, shape and you know architecturally we were making wanting to make sure that the six foot eight minimum branch height uh, would be main, maintaining the proper head height um, and protruding object clearances. Um, all cutting, kerping, uh, the connection hardware was installed before shipping as Russ uh, was noting in his previous couple of slides um, and so that really when uh, it was sent out to the site it's really just a kit of parts um, assembled already uh, and ready to be installed on site. And each of these columns actually stores an average of a thousand pounds of CO2. Um, and so if you can imagine uh, all of these being brought back to the site, um, as you can see here, this is really the use of actual tree, col tree members as columns in their most kind of original organic form does create a bit of whimsy and really grounds the design and potentially encourages a sense of place since these uh, were harvested and then brought back to the site. Yeah, they look, I mean, wow. It's like a piece of artwork within the school. They're really beautiful. Um, so that's our, our last slide. Besides, um, as, we, as we wrap up here, we've been collecting um, some quotes from projects that have finished that are mass timber. And I know there's oftentimes a lot of hesitancy about exposing wood in schools for fear that it might get damaged, but that hasn't been the experience of this project team. And we've really gotten some great feedback from clients about uh, using wood and, and how that changes the interior uh, feel um, and how people actually react to those wood surfaces um, when they're actually occupying the buildings. So we think there's great potential here. Um, and I wanna thank our panelists today for taking the time to share this really amazing information. Um, so thank you all and um, we'll find ways to share our contact information. So if you have any questions, you can contact us in the future. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>